Hello and welcome to Tales of the Wild. My name's Mark, I'm the host of the only podcast where you can learn scientific facts about animal species through stories. In this episode, we'll be following a troop of baboons as they live out their wild lives on the African savanna. We'll learn about some key primate behaviours, social grouping and social dynamics. We'll follow a remarkable journey based on real observations of the very well-known professor of biology and neurology at Stanford University, Robert Sapolsky, who's dedicated over 25 years of his life to studying baboon behavior in Kenya. Well, this sounds like a terrible thing to confess after 30 years, but I don't actually like baboons all that much. I mean, there's been individual guys over the years who I absolutely love, but they're these schemy, backstabbing, Machiavellian bastards. Some of his findings have had very interesting implications for our own species, but more on that later. It's going to be a tale of conflict. It's a tale of loss. It's a tale of resolution and hope. So whether you're listening at home or at work or driving a car or going for a walk or a run, take a deep breath, relax and set your mind at ease as we temporarily enter the wild world of another species. Welcome to Tales of the Wild. The crickets were so loud it was almost painful. The sun was beating down on the dusty ground and the wind rocked the tops of the tall tough blades of grass in long waves. The landscape was a vast painting of yellowish green grass, broken up by almost black shadows of small trees. There wasn't a cloud in sight in the expansive sky above. The red clay earth was occasionally made visible by thinning patches of grass blowing in the wind or by shrubs uprooted by large herbivores. There was a strong earthy smell in the air. A savanna like this is something between a grassland and a woodland. It's a habitat characterized by trees that are sufficiently widely spaced so that the canopy doesn't close above. This means that the light from the sun can reach the ground to support an unbroken herbaceous layer, consisting primarily of grasses, which are absent in a forest. These grasses can support a number of different grazing species. In Africa, some of the species which graze include buffaloes, wildebeest, zebras, and hippos. In contrast to the grazers, there are species which have evolved to pick at the leaves and fruits of the shrubs and trees. These species are known as browsers, and a few examples of browsers would include giraffes, kudus, which is a species of antelope with very large spiraling horns, and also the critically endangered black rhinos. Most species out here don't fit neatly into one category or the other. For example, even elephants, which are known to be particularly destructive when foraging for food, will eat up to 240 kilograms of grass per day, by tearing out clumps of tall grass with their trunks and mashing them up with their ever-growing teeth. Another example of a species which inhabits the savanna is the baboon. Most baboon species can't survive on grass alone because they don't have a stomach full of cellulose-digesting microorganisms found in ruminants such as cows or sheep. Nor do they have the continuous growing teeth required to resist the abrasive qualities of the high silica content that grass produces as its primary defense against being eaten. Baboons therefore must heavily supplement their diet with berries, meat, vegetables and whatever else they can steal from farms or settlements. Sitting in the shadow of a small twisted acacia tree is an olive baboon called Zolani. She has a dark shadow cast over her eyes by a very prominent eyebrow ridge. Her shaded amber colored eyes told a story. It was a story of pain, stress and exhaustion. Her tough, worn looking face had a protruding snout like a dog 
Although unlike a dog, the canine teeth this snout housed could grow more than 5 centimeters long. That makes these canines even longer than those of a lion. Although she was thin, she was not an animal to be messed with. While baboons are generally fearful of humans when trapped or cornered, these animals can and have broken human bones with those jaws and teeth. Her eyes seemed somehow smaller than you would expect, like two dark marbles. They contained the essence of a truly wild animal. It's hard to describe what this essence is, but you know it when you see it. It's an unpredictable and volatile instinct which burns very close to the surface, a willingness to act impulsively without hesitation. Sometimes you see it in the face of a drunk wandering around the city streets in the early hours of the morning, or a fox that prowls the same streets while he digs through the trash. It's that split-second look in the eyes of a house burglar when they hear your car pulling into the driveway. A whisker away from fight or flight at all times. Those dangerous-looking eyes darted rapidly between members of her social group, scanning for trouble, but also careful to avoid direct eye contact. Her eyes were wide open, and despite being among the others of her troop, she was the embodiment of stress and fear and there was good reason for this. The olive baboon, so named because of the slight yellowish-green tinge to its fur, like all of the five species of baboons, is a primate. The other baboon species are the Hamadryas baboon, the Guinea baboon, the yellow baboon, and the Chakma baboon. Now when I say primate, I know that this term means different things to different people and it can be easy to confuse the terms ape, great ape, monkey, and primate, so I want to briefly explain these things. You probably remember learning in biology class at school that dear King Philip came over for good soup. This was the classic mnemonic that we had to learn to remember the hierarchy of life classification, which goes domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. The fact that I had to Google this mnemonic after more than 15 years of studying animals shows that it really doesn't work very well, and I attribute this to it being nonsensical. Kings just don't come over for good soup. I've never heard of any king eating any kind of soup, but even if they do, they don't come to seek it out. Good soup goes to them. A far superior mnemonic, which we'll use for the future of this podcast, is do keep pond clean or froggy gets sick. Because unlike that nonsense about a king coming over to eat soup, this one is actually good advice. Frogs are very sensitive to poor water quality, so it's important to take care of your pond. Of course, with our incessant need to try to neatly classify the vast, continuously stirring soup of genetic diversity in which we exist, we've invented a lot of subcategories to go along with these eight levels. But for the sake of our sanity, we will for now pretend that these don't exist and stick to do keep pond clean or froggy gets sick. So back to explaining the terms primate, ape, great ape and monkey. All of these creatures fall into the order of primates, which emerged about 80 million years ago. So gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, tarsiers, lorises, gibbons, humans, baboons, monkeys, orangutans, marmosets, lemurs are all of the order of primates. About 20 million years ago, a group of primates split off from the other group, which was called monkeys, into its own evolutionary branch called the apes. Then the apes split into a further subcategory of lesser apes and great apes. The great apes include all of the apes, including ourselves, except gibbons. Gibbons are considered lesser apes. So we humans are primates, we're also apes, we're also great apes, but we're not monkeys. You might be wondering what defines an evolutionary branching event in the phylogenetic tree. How many deviations from the ancestral physiology warrant a new classification or a subclassification? There's no easy answer to this, as it seems that many cases seem to be rather arbitrary. But in the case of apes, it was decided that the absence of a tail and the freedom of the shoulder joint 
which allowed swinging from branch to branch, a type of arboreal locomotion easily remembered by its technical name, which is branchiation, was deemed sufficient. Unlike us, a baboon is a type of primate called a monkey. They're not very good at swinging through trees and they do have a tail, so that makes them a type of monkey. Perhaps because of their larger size compared to most other monkeys, we could also call them great monkeys, but this classification doesn't exist yet. Solani's wild eyes settled on her young daughter, who was playing in the acacia tree behind her. They had a very strong connection, and her daughter rarely left her side. This was very important for her daughter's safety for two reasons. The first was the potential for predation. All baboons can be predated by leopards, cheetahs, lions, hyenas, rock pythons, crocodiles, chimpanzees, and wild dogs. An additional threat for young baboons because of their smaller size, comes from the skies in the form of raptors such as the African crowned eagle or the martial eagle. These young baboons are highly dependent on their parents, and the females which take about five years to mature usually remain within the same troop for their entire lives, giving them the opportunity to form very strong social bonds. Another threat that faces baboons is murder from their own species, particularly infanticide, the killing of a juvenile baboon which occurs in particular when a male has been overthrown. By killing the young, the new alpha male of the group ensures that the troop resources are not spent on raising an animal which is not genetically related to him, and in addition the female will become receptive again much sooner, so that he can father children of his own. What appears to us as a cruel, immoral and brutal murder of an innocent infant, which it is, from the ambivalent perspective of Mother Nature, is a means to facilitate the continuation of advantageous genes and culture in an ever-changing world. It's one of nature's harsh realities which we might prefer not to observe, but are often forced to accept. Solani watched her daughter dangling upside down above her by her feet from a low-hanging branch in the acacia tree. She was already a good climber, Young baboons always are, but she didn't have a prehensile tail like some other species of monkey. A prehensile tail is of course useful when you spend a lot of time foraging in trees because it serves as an additional hand that can twist around and grip branches to help with climbing and allow you to eat hands free and also sometimes feet free. Baboons are more land-dwelling or terrestrial than many other species of monkey, so they don't have a need for such a tail. Their tail is mainly used for balance when running and for aiding with communication. The young monkey dangled her arms down and began to swing gently, as though she were lifeless. She swung her hands closer and closer to her mother's head, until they were brushing the top of her mother's hair with each swing. With mock anger, Solani began slapping the hanging open palms of her daughter's hands, and her daughter squealed with delight as she swung back and forth trying to keep her hands free from her mother's grasp. Although she was young, the palms of her hands were already covered in tough black rubbery skin. Unlike the majority of apes, which engage in knuckle walking, Baboons walk on the palms of their hands and need a tough layer of skin to protect them from the rough ground. She dropped out of the tree into her mother's arms and Zolani began picking through her daughter's fur for ticks. This grooming behaviour was relaxing for them both and Zolani finally managed to settle down a little as her daughter fell asleep. This acacia tree was her haven of peace. The location was not desirable enough for the dominant males of the troop to push her out, and she was dominant enough among the females so that they rarely tried to take her place. Of course, when the tree was flowering, the situation was different. The more dominant members of the troop took over to eat the flowers and the insects that they attracted. But it wasn't the flowers or the insects that she liked in particular, she just found it a peaceful and familiar place.
She looked over to the fifty or so other animals around her. These were the more peaceful members of the troop. But don't get me wrong, there's nothing peaceful about baboons, at least not for any significant amount of time. There are these schemy, backstabbing, Machiavellian bastards. bastards, 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 bastards. There was occasional screaming and chasing going on. They were constantly testing each other's limits. For baboons, when they're not fighting a common enemy, engaging in communal grooming, eating or sleeping, they're usually bickering amongst themselves and trying to reshuffle the hierarchy. You live in a place like this, you're a baboon, and you only have to spend about three hours a day getting your calories. And if you only have to work three hours a day, you got nine hours of free time every day to devote to making somebody else just miserable. Those above will bully those below to maintain dominance, and those below will try to push the limits set upon them by those above. But as I said, these were the much more peaceful animals in the troop, and the aggression always had at least a little element of play to it. It was occurring at a much lower frequency when compared to normal. The more dominant males, particularly the alpha male, were very different. They were mean. Their aggression often resulted in blood, exile from the group, and in rare occasions, even death. These males had gone out scavenging, which in these times meant eating human leftovers in the local garbage dump. While the rewards were high, the costs were too high for most members of the troop. The problem with garbage raiding in this particular dump is that it was located inside the border of the territory of a neighbouring troop of aggressive and rather overweight baboons. These big baboons did not take kindly to intruders trying to share the spoilings of their garbage dump. For this reason, most of Zelani's troop were not willing to risk coming in such close proximity with the oversized barbarians to find food. There was also occasionally an issue with upright walking apes who delivered the food scraps. But they were slow and not very persistent, but they did occasionally throw sticks and stones which were very painful. Those baboons which were bold enough to venture into this local garbage site, despite the presence of the other troop, shared two characteristics. Firstly, they were very aggressive and this was necessary to try and obtain scraps from this dump while being attacked by the other baboons. Secondly, they were not particularly interested in socialising with their troop. This was evident by the fact that garbage raiding took place usually during the communal grooming hours of the day, so the members of Zolani's troop who raided the dumps were both antisocial and aggressive individuals, and this is important to keep in mind. So you can imagine that Zolani was not too happy to hear the familiar screams on the horizon, followed by several other calls of the other scavengers returning after a morning of eating leftover junk food. She sat upright and her daughter gripped her tightly and looked out over the top of the tall grass. There were about 15 of them making their way back to camp. It was clear, even from this distance, that their scavenging had been successful. In any case, you could see from their sizes that these individuals were better fed than the other baboons in the troop. They were high on the calorie-rich junk food they'd found. They were screaming excessively while moving in the general direction of the camp, and they were running off on tangents, chasing each other, biting, posturing, showing off and fighting. What seemed like play one moment could and would break out into a fully aggressive attack a few moments later. She saw one individual walking at the back and towering behind the other baboons. He walked slowly and confidently and did not engage in most of the fighting. That was Reth. He was the alpha male of the group and the father of her daughter. He was a particularly cruel leader and because of his size and status, it was unlikely that he would be overthrown for years to come. At least that's what she thought at the time. Zolani's heart rate started to increase. She felt a tension in her head and in her muscles. She held her daughter close, sat up straight and mentally prepared herself as her wild amber eyes started to dart around again. Olive baboons live in groups of 15 to 200 individuals called troops. Social living like this provides many advantages. 
there are more eyes to watch for predators and more teeth to defend against them, and they can share knowledge about food locations with each other. On the other hand, it comes with the downside that close contact between individuals of the same species can result in increased chances of parasites and disease. When it comes to external parasites, baboons are very good at both collecting them in their fur, but also removing them by hand, from themselves and from each other. This grooming behaviour has extended beyond its original purpose. What was once about becoming parasite-free for one participant, and about finding an easy meal for the other participant, is now also a sign of acceptance, and it helps to build a strong social bond between individuals. Grooming has been shown to be a highly reciprocated activity, and individuals who have groomed each other are less likely to engage in conflict and more likely to support each other during conflict. To expose your neck to another who grooms it is a great sign of trust, and additionally to offer the service to another baboon is a great indicator of social security. When it comes to internal parasites, baboons are certainly susceptible to these, like most mammals, but they're also pretty good at detecting the quality of food before they eat it. They can use sight, smell and taste to determine whether food is good to eat before they consume it. They will also very rarely touch meat that they have not seen moving, probably as a mechanism to avoid the high bacteria load found on carcasses that have entered any state of decomposition. The troops mainly consist of females, with a much smaller number of males. The baboons in a troop experience life within the same troop very differently depending on where they rank in the dominance hierarchy. Females are physically smaller and males are generally more dominant. If you happen to be higher up on the hierarchy, you can enjoy access to more resources, whether that be food, security or reproductive rights. This access to more resources helps you to stay healthy and therefore to keep your place high up in the hierarchy. But while there are several advantages to being high up in the hierarchy, it does come at a cost. The cost is the effort that must go into being constantly challenged by others who want to take your place. Life is not particularly easy for either side of the hierarchy in the species, but there's a strong compulsion for individuals to try and rise up through the ranks, particularly on reaching maturity. Interestingly, dominance is hereditary in baboons, which means that the daughters of high-ranking mothers also have a high rank. Reth and his gang of dominant males arrived back with the troop, howling out something between a greeting and a warning. They chased the other baboons out of the best sitting places and waited to be groomed. Scavenging was a dirty business after all. While they were not liked by the other members of the troop, the more submissive animals were eager to be the groomer for these baboons. Anything which might keep them safe during the high calorie and high testosterone fueled chaos that they have to live in when the whole troop was together. Reth walked slowly over to Zolani and saw his daughter in her arms. When he reached Zolani, he moved his head close to hers. She lowered her eyes immediately and looked to the side. He moved his face closer to hers until his eyes were just a whisker away. His eyes were a much darker and richer amber than hers. He had cuts and scars all over his face from fighting with other baboons, but also from several encounters with barbed wire and broken glass and scrap metal found in the dump. Some parts of the fur on his head were also wet with oil. He inhaled a long sniff through his nose. He could smell his daughter and he looked down into the arms of Zolani where a small head was poking out of the fur. He lowered his gaze and she looked at him straight in the eyes with curiosity. She put out a small hand to try and touch his face but he snarled and showed a portion of his giant teeth. Zolani growled at her daughter and pulled her away. Reth seemed to be suddenly filled with angry energy and he jumped up, pushing off the tree with his hind legs and shot past the mother and daughter, colliding with and beating one of the submissive males. The poor male screamed and ran away as fast as he could. The other individuals scattered away and Reth climbed on top of the highest rock in the area. He let out a long howl and then sat down. 
Other baboons rushed over to him to start grooming him. He slapped a few of them away and barked at another, and then he allowed the remaining two to groom him while he lay down and began to sleep. Zalani sighed and sat down, but it didn't take long for another dominant male who had noticed the boss sleeping to advance towards her and sit down much too close for her comfort. Within seconds, another one of the dominant males saw this, became jealous, and ran over screaming to fight this male. Within a few moments, there were four males and two females scrapping on the floor next to Zolani's peaceful acacia tree and generating a large cloud of dust. Her daughter became very afraid and started screaming. Zolani had had enough of these stupid animals. She lost her nerve and ran at the group of squabbling primates and scratched and bit every piece of fur and flesh she could find in the cloud of dust. Her daughter was now alone. Baboons were running backwards and forwards trying to bite and hit one another. When one baboon had had enough, it wasn't long before another joined the battle. Reth, who had been sleeping, slowly opened one of his dark amber eyes and cast it towards the fight. There was nothing that excited him like violence. It was even better than raiding and sleeping. His other eye opened and he sat up. One of the baboons who had been beaten badly in the conflict was fleeing from the fight in his direction. Reth stopped him in his tracks and yawned, displaying his giant canines. The beaten baboon assumed a crouching stance with his rear end raised. This posture is universally recognized among baboons as a sign of subordination. It is a surrender to the dominance of the other and a wish to end the conflict. The conventional response on the part of the victorious male is to subject the other to a ritualized gesture of dominance such as mounting him. In this instance, however, Reth approached the loser as if to mount him but instead abruptly gave him a deep slash with his canine and then walked away to the others in the conflict, leaving this now beaten baboon bleeding and limping away. Reth was thinking about running into the center of the fight to send them all scattering, but then he noticed his daughter by the acacia tree. This time she was alone. He stood up on all fours and walked calmly towards her. She saw him coming and started climbing the acacia tree frantically to get away. She was very afraid of her father. He approached the trunk of the tree and looked up at her. She could not read his expression and did not know how much trouble she might be in. In reality, Reth had not decided himself what he would do. He was just curious. He hadn't spent much time with his daughter before. She had an instinctive fear of him. She had seen how violent he had been with the others, and she'd learned from her mother not to trust him. He stood on his hind legs using his arms to support himself against the trunk of the small twisted tree, and then pounced up onto the branch next to her. Before she knew it, he had grabbed her in one of his hands. She bit his hand, and he howled and let go of her. She looked at him terrified that she was going to be in serious trouble now, but she saw his expression change from one of incredulity to something akin to humor in human beings. If baboons could laugh, he would be laughing right now. He indicated that he would like to play and he pretended to run away from her. She immediately knew what to do and she chased him. When she caught up with him, which he made easy for her, she slapped him on the back and he gave out a pretend roar of pain and started to chase her back. She was starting to enjoy the game and forgot all about her concerns. She jumped back into the tree, screaming excitedly. At just this moment, Zalani became anxious about her daughter. She looked up out of the cloud of dust to see Reth chasing her daughter into the tree. Zalani immediately broke away from the fight and ran straight towards her daughter to protect her. She caught up with Reth and bit him so hard on the tail that it broke the bone and the tail kinked. He let out a roar of pain. This time it was genuine. He spun around furiously and charged at her. Terrified, she ran for her life around the acacia tree in circles, 
but he was faster and on the fourth lap he caught her by the hind leg and proceeded to beat her. Their daughter dropped out of the tree and was tugging at his tail to stop him, but he span around quickly and looked at her with so much rage that she cowered away. She could do nothing but watch as her mother was attacked. Other baboons joined in the attack to try and gain rapport with Reth. Zilani kept her eyes to the ground, made submissive sounds and gestures, and looked for an opportunity to escape. The beating stopped eventually. She was bloodied and no longer moving. Reth gave out one last angry roar as he turned around and walked back to his favourite rock. As the sun went down on the savannah that evening, a deep red moon rose into the African sky, casting a network of crooked shadows across the landscape. The troop was soon sleeping silently in the dim red light. A small silhouette crawled down slowly from the shadow of an acacia tree and crawled tentatively towards another silhouetted lump on the ground which had not moved for hours. Violence is built into the nature of baboons. For a long time we thought that we were the only primate which kills its own kind, but it's now clear that we're not the only savages. Murder and infanticide and even war-like coordinated attacks occur in several species of primate. But importantly, not all. There are some species of primates, such as gibbons, who live very peacefully with one another. This is interesting because it's something that we struggle to achieve in our own species, and perhaps understanding these differences will lead us to be able to better understand why. So scientists have tried to examine the reasons and mechanisms behind violence and peace in different species of primates. They're not being stressed by lions chasing them all the time, they're being stressed by each other. They're being stressed by social and psychological tumult invented by their own species. They're a perfect model for westernized stress-related disease. Is there a basis for this aggression embedded within the DNA of baboons, or is it something that's learned and passed down through generations as a type of inherited culture? It's often said that the victims of abuse in our own species have a higher chance of becoming abusers themselves. Violence begets violence. Could this also be the case for baboons? There's considerable evidence that suggests that this is in fact the case. It may not be a hardwired code in the DNA of the animals, but rather a learned mechanism based on grouped social dynamics and interactions. In the early 1970s, a primatologist called Hans Kuma was working in Ethiopia with two species of baboons that have a very different social system. Hamadryas baboons are a species with a complex multi-level society. Like all baboons, they're no strangers to internal conflict. But when confronted with a threatening dominant male, the females are able to placate the males through their behaviour. In the same situation, however, a savannah baboon female would have no choice but to run away in order to avoid injury. Kuma trapped a female from each species and moved them into a troop from the other species. As a consequence, there was one female savannah baboon living amongst the Hamadryas baboons, and one female Hamadryas baboon living amongst the savannah baboons. This type of experiment is called cross-fostering. By raising a species in a novel environment, it can be assumed that any differences that occur are due to the environment rather than due to the genetics. If there was only a genetic basis for conflict-associated behaviours in these two baboon species, then one would expect no change in the behaviour of the two females. The savannah baboon would continue to try and run away from conflict, and the hamadryas baboon would continue to try to placate the male. But what happened was really quite remarkable. In the new environment, the species' typical behaviour of these female baboons was a major faux pas in the new troops. Running away from conflict was not accepted by the Karma Hamadryas baboons, and similarly, savannah baboons did not tolerate anything other than running away from dominant males. Over time, the two females did manage to conform to the new rules. What is very surprising is that this did not take months, 
or weeks, or even days. It happened in about an hour. In a similar experiment exploring the same question, Deval and his student Denis Johanovich ran an experiment with two species of macaques. Rhesus macaques have rigid hierarchies. The individuals at the top get exclusive access to more resources and defend this right with ferocious aggression. They rarely reconcile after fights. Male stump-tail macaques, on the other hand, which share almost all of their genes with the rhesus macaques, display much less aggression, more affiliative behaviours and more egalitarianism. In a captive setting, the scientists created a mixed-sex group of juvenile macaques from the two species combined together. Our instinct might suggest that the more aggressive rhesus macaques would quickly dominate the stump-tailed macaques in the group. But interestingly, over a period of a few months, the rhesus macaques adopted the stump-tailed macaques more laid-back social style, eventually even matching the stump-tail's high rates of reconciliatory behaviour. The, stump the stump-tails and rhesus macaques used different gestures when reconciling. Interestingly, the rhesus macaques in the study didn't start using the stump-tailed macaques' reconciliatory gestures, but rather increased the incidence of their own species' typical gestures. In other words, they weren't merely imitating the stump tail's behavior. They were incorporating the concept of the frequent reconciliation into their own social practices. When these now more civilized rhesus macaques were returned to their original all rhesus group, incredibly, this new behavior persisted. So what does this mean? It shows that primates are capable of adopting a social culture and keeping it. What it doesn't show us is that these cultural changes can persist over generations. For that we need to continue our tale. When you dig a little deeper into baboon society, it's evident that what appears to be a relatively simple reproductive dynamic from the outside is vastly more complex. You might think that the big strong alpha male chooses with whom he breeds, and that she has no say in the matter. We now know that female baboons are pretty good at getting away from even the champions of male-to-male -male competition. If they want to, they can sneak off with another male that they actually desire. And who would that be? Typically it's the male that followed a very different strategy of building relationships with the female, for example by grooming her a lot helping her to take care of her young, and it also helps if he refrains from beating her up. Interestingly, these nice guy males seem to pass on at least as many copies of their genes as their more aggressive peers, not least because they can go on like this for years without the life-shortening burnout and injuries of the gladiators in the troop. We move forwards now to four years after the death of Zelani. A calm baboon was sitting next to a female baboon and grooming her as she slept in the sun. The female was Zalani's daughter. She had survived her mother's death. She was too young to be weaned away from her mother, but she had other female relatives who helped to take care of her. She'd learned to avoid conflict with the aggressive members of the troop, but not without some scars, and she tried to spend most of her time with the submissive males and females. One male had taken a particular liking to her. He was always quick to help her to escape conflict, and he would spend afternoons like this one with her, by her side and grooming her. She had learned to trust him, and to see him almost as a different species to the more aggressive members of the group who had followed Reth out to scavenge the garbage dump as usual. Instead of raiding the garbage dump with the others, this male had participated in the morning communal grooming sessions during which he focused his attention particularly on her, which she did not mind at all. She was almost a fully mature adult. She was coming into her first ovulation cycle, and in baboons, along with many other primate species, this is often signalled not only by olfactory cues, but also by visual cues in the form of a large and sometimes colourful swelling of their rear end. If you would insert four or five pink balloons into a large flexible sock and inflate them to the point of almost bursting, this is more or less what the backside of a receptive female baboon looks like. But beauty is in the eye of the beholder, 
and what might appear as grotesque and repulsive to us can be highly attractive and inviting to male baboons who will compete for females with the largest swellings. Solani's daughter had noticed that she was entering the early phase of this change and some of the males had also started to notice. They chased her more frequently and she often found herself surrounded by several males at a time trying to groom her or beat her up. She was becoming the centre of attention among the males in the troop, and given her hatred of the majority of these suitors, the extra attention was not welcomed by her. So she enjoyed the peace that was left behind when the other baboons went away scavenging. It was getting later in the day, and the garbage raid was taking much longer than usual. For the baboons that had remained behind, they had enjoyed an extra long period of relaxation. They'd had plenty of time to engage in grooming and relatively peaceful coexistence. As the sun began to set down in the late afternoon, the aggressive members of the troop had still not returned. Zelani's daughter decided to investigate. She was afraid of going too close to the dump, but she had to see what had happened there. The tall grass brushed against her hands and feet as she walked. She'd taken a few of the other baboons with her for safety. As the sun went down, nocturnal predators became a threat. When she finally arrived near the garbage dump, it was completely lifeless. There were no baboons to be seen. She let out a loud call, but there was no response. Then she heard a cough coming from the grass just ahead of her. She moved closer and looked down. To her surprise, she saw her father, Reth. He was lying down on his side, but not in a sleeping position. He seemed to be in great pain. As she moved closer, his dark amber eyes locked with hers, and then he looked away. His breathing was laboured. Each inhale was weaker than the last, and every exhale was accompanied by a gurgling sound, and there was some foaming around his mouth. She was so afraid that she and the other baboons ran back to the troop. So what had happened? The answer is a bacteria-borne disease called tuberculosis. It's much more rapid and fatal in non-human primates and had broken out in the troop living near the garbage dump. When the others had been conducting their raid, they'd caught this disease and quickly succumbed to its effects. Not one of them had survived. So what effect does it have on a troop when nature takes away all of the aggressive and antisocial individuals? You might expect this to create a power vacuum that needs to be filled. Perhaps the remaining baboons would become more aggressive to assert their dominance. Interestingly, this is not what happened, at least not to the extent one might expect. The more dominant of the nice guy baboons that were left behind were much less aggressive than the dominant males in a typical baboon troop and this did not change. While there were fighting bouts, they were much less frequent. The dominant males spent much more time grooming and attempting to avoid conflict, and in some cases they even showed male-to-male -male grooming, which is almost unheard of in this species. What had occurred is what evolutionary biologists call a selective bottleneck. In the absence of the aggressive dominant males, the troop was now unusually peaceful. But the largest surprise did not come until some years later. Solani's daughter went on to give birth to a daughter of her own. The daughter would be raised in the same troop where she would spend the rest of her life. But the environment she would live in would be very different to that that her mother had grown up in. The inherent fear of male baboon aggression that her mother had was no longer present in the troop. It's important to remember that olive baboon society dictates that males will leave the troop when they become sexually mature at about seven years. This means that adolescent males would always leave the troop, but they would be replaced by outsider adolescent males. Females, on the other hand, would remain within the same troop for their whole lives. By the 1990s, all of the original male baboons in the troop had died or moved to other troops. As they were being replaced by males that were raised in different troops, you might expect the new males to bring violence back into this now more peaceful society. 
Interestingly, this is not what happened. The new males that joined the troop, instead of using aggression as a pathway to gain rank, adopted the unique behavioural style of the resident males. As defined by both anthropologists and animal behaviourists, culture consists of local behavioural variations occurring for non-genetic reasons. For it to be culture, it must last beyond the time of their originators. This unique baboon troop's low aggression and highly social society is evidence of a multi-generational culture. While the exact mechanism of this transfer of culture is not clear, it's possible that after the outbreak of tuberculosis killed off the aggressive male members of the troop, it left the troop with half the number of males, and in addition, the males that did remain were the nice guy males. As a consequence of this, the females may have become more relaxed and less wary of violent males. This, in turn, might lead to their willingness to take a chance and reach out socially to newly arriving males, who at first are typical adolescent baboons, but soon, after finding themselves being treated so well by the females in the group, eventually relax and adopt the behaviours of the troop's distinctive social culture. This tale is based on a true story of events that unfolded in a real baboon troop observed by Robert Sapolsky, who spent many years in the field practically living with them. These amazing observations raise several interesting philosophical points for our own species. What would it take for our own species to become more peaceful? Is this even possible? If baboons can do it, then despite our history, it certainly does not seem so impossible. Thanks for listening to Tales of the Wild. This time we learned about the differences between primates, apes, great apes and monkeys. We learned the useful advice, do keep pond clean or froggy gets sick, which also happens to be a mnemonic for domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. We learned about a troop of baboons who lost half of their males due to an outbreak of tuberculosis, leaving only the less aggressive males behind, and the cultural shift that ensued within the troop. I hope you enjoyed the tale, and if you did, please remember to subscribe to the podcast. If you're in a position to do so, you can also support me on Patreon by following the link in the description. Thanks again, and see you next time on Tales of the Wild. You scheming, backstabbing, Machiavellian bastards. bastards, bastards, bastards.